today we've come to the Lincolnshire village of Torxey. It's a beautiful morning and I'm standing beside the River Trent where it joins the Fosdyke, believed by many people to be the oldest canal in Britain, built by the Romans in the second century. It's a reminder of why we've come to Torxey. It's just the most fantastically interesting historical centre. So we can start with the Romans. We're going to go on to consider the Saxons who made this one of the most important towns in England. Then it became actually the Viking winter quarters. The Vikings came and camped here beside the River Trent. But after that a thousand years of decline for Torxey. We'll investigate what has disappeared from the landscape here before a slight revival later on with the building of a, a, a gentleman's house called Torxey Castle. We'll hear about how that was destroyed in the Civil War. And then the other interesting feature here was this spectacular Victorian bridge, which has a fascinating history of its own. So I'm really looking forward to exploring the Lincolnshire village of Torxey. Well, I'm coming down off this rather slippery pontoon to have a closer look at the Foss Dyke. And most historians now believe that it was built by the Romans in the, in the second century. In fact, Roman artefacts have been found in it. And what the Romans wanted to do was to connect the River Witham system at Lincoln with the River Trent and the Ouse so they could take boats from Lincoln to York and it probably also had a bit of a drainage function as well. Now the Romans didn't have a lock technology so they couldn't get boats up and down they needed to find the route to connect the two river systems where they were as level as possible although there was always a problem that the Trent was particularly tidal. Anyway they found the route through to Torxey and you can still see that on the map how the Fosdyke was aligned in order to bring it into the Trent at the right point. Now the canal, the Fosdyke, has survived for therefore nearly 2,000 years now, but it's not always been uh, easy to operate. It's always been prone to silting up. At the time of King Henry I, for example, uh, there was a lot of uh, issues about it being blocked. And the time of Charles II, extra work had to be done about it. But it's a fascinating place and we're going to go and have a closer look at Torxey locks which were added obviously many years after the Romans and are really a fundamental feature of the landscape around here. So that's where I'm going to go next. Well I'm now standing right outside Torxey lock and of course locks are things that Romans did not have. The existence of locks here reflects man's attempt to manage competing challenges at this location. On the one hand there's the interest of the navigation in order to bring boats up and down. On the other there was the problem of flood and drainage of the land. Some people wanted the land drained, many of the locals didn't. The problem here was that the Fosdyke waters are above the level of the land and actually above the level of the Trent for much of the year. But at some points in the year the Trent is in flood, the water level is higher and there is a risk that the waters of the Trent will flood back to the city of Lincoln as they used to do uh, tens of thousands of years ago. The first lock gate then was built here in 1672 uh, in order to try to manage these issues. But that put at risk the locals' use of the Fenland for their own purposes, part of a scheme of Charles II drainage, in fact. And in 1680, the lock gates here were destroyed by the local people. We've now come up from the huge gate designed to keep the Trent floodwaters out onto Torxey Bridge above this series of locks. In fact I'm actually standing against the parapet of the old Torxey Bridge, a strategic point in this area as we shall find out later on. But I want to talk about this area in the 1700s. It was a time of revival for the navigation. From 1744 
the Ellison family of Lincoln were put in control of it uh, and they improved it, made it more efficient, but they also became extremely wealthy as a result. Land drainage was taking place, but there were some major challenges with floods in 1770 particularly. Uh, and that year, the Trent water came over the top of the gate uh, to a depth of four feet across the local land. And all that water piled across the landscape towards Lincoln, where there was a significant problem. The High Street in Lincoln forms a dam against the flood waters. All the water channeled under the old high bridge. As the waters approached the city, they brought with it old haystacks that they'd gathered along the way. And the mayor of Lincoln realized there was a real danger that the High Street Bridge would be blocked and the whole of Lower Lincoln would be badly flooded. So we have this scene of people trying to hoik the haystacks out of the water in order to preserve the city. 1795, another disastrous flood. The water tore down the floodgates, flooded this whole area to Lincoln and many villages to a depth of several feet. Uh, and the water stayed for over three weeks. So that people in parts of Saxelby, for example, had to go and live in their parish church as a, as a safe place. So this beautiful, peaceful scene today uh, really is a bit beguiling because there is always risk here. And you'll see in the background, even alongside that modern caravan estate, there are some flood banks there designed to protect them not from the Fosdyke, but from the Trent. I'm standing on the south bank of the Foss Dyke, very close to Torxey Bridge, and behind me you can see some open fields leading up to the castle and the church, parish church of Torxey, that exists today. In fact, those empty fields were once one of the most important towns in England, now totally disappeared. Uh, what we know there was that probably a thousand people or so lived there in Saxon times and it was very important as a centre of the pottery industry. Torxy ware, the local product, has been found in vast quantities in York. So probably you can imagine the barges going from here to York with, with pottery that then got broken and needed replacing. So it was a big industrial centre. Um, it went through a period then though of decline, particularly after the Vikings and by the time of the Normans, things were starting to, to uh, fall apart. Probably because the Fosdyke was silted up and blocked and therefore travel and trade to Lincoln was badly reduced. And so we go through this period of a thousand years of Torx's decline, to the extent now that you can look in that field, and though the archaeologists can tell you where the houses were, you won't be able to see any with your own eye. We've come about half a mile north of Torxey Lock into modern Torxey. And it's really just on the northern edge of where the medieval town of Torxey was. I'm standing outside the old pub, the Hume Arms, named after one of the local landowning families. And I'm interested that on the old maps, it says Abbey Close. And I'm in search of one of Torxey's medieval abbeys, St Leonard's. So let's see if we can find it down this footpath to Abbey Close. According to the map, uh, just alongside here is Abbey Close, uh, where it was believed that the monks lived. And what we're talking about here is St Leonard's Priory, which was a monastery started here in the early 1100s by King John or King Henry, one of two religious residential establishments that the medieval town of Torxey had. There was St Leonard's here for men, 
and there was the Foss nunnery for women, which is believed to have been much closer to the Foss dyke in the old Saxon town. The St Leonard's Monastery was never very successful. It was always short of money and by the time of the dissolution of the monasteries in the 1530s there were only four resident canons who lived here. So not a very successful place. What there was also here, uh, just beyond me really, is the site of St Mary's Church, one of Torx's three medieval churches. But the population declined so much that those churches were not all needed and gradually the parishes were amalgamated uh, and now we're left with just one. You might say, where is the monastery? Well, we're in an area where good building stone was very rare. People didn't tend to let old buildings stand around for long before they found a way of reusing the stonework. So pretty well everything above the surface has vanished. Occasionally people have found uh, interesting old artefacts. Uh, for example, in the 1800s they found a shield and a gig, a very rude medieval carving, perhaps from the old church, uh, which was which was dug up. Some of the guidebooks say that the last remains of St Leonard's were broken up and turned into grit stone for the roads in the 1800s. To be honest, I've heard that story about no end of places, so I tend not to believe it. So, a nice place, but nothing here by way of an abbey. What we can do is go and have a look at Torx's remaining medieval church. We weren't very successful trying to find the old abbey or the old St Mary's church, but we are now outside St Peter's, the one remaining medieval church in Torxey. And it's got a beautiful churchyard, lovely old limestone wall, which clearly has come from somewhere else. Let's go in the churchyard and see what we can find of interest. I'm now in the churchyard, beautiful English country churchyard of Torx's one remaining medieval church. It's a church from the 13th century, quite a nice sturdy tower and there's one or two quite interesting uh, faces in the stonework that are worth a closer look. It's also a fabulous churchyard, really interesting wall around it, uh, clearly made out of limestone and you wonder which of Torx's medieval buildings that stonework in the churchyard came from. Uh, but the history of this church is quite interesting because notoriously it was a very poor living. In other words, if you were vicar here, the pay was very little. And throughout its history, there are great gaps where there's no known incumbent of this parish. In the um, Civil War period, in the 1640s and 50s, they did actually get a man called William Quip, who was one of the local Puritans, to come and provide services here. But in 1662, Charles II brought back many of the traditions of the Church of England, high church traditions, and William Quip was removed from Torxey. Uh, and after that, we've got no idea of any other clergyman serving the village until 1706. It really didn't attract people to come and work here. One thing that happened, of course, was in that case, other people filled the gaps. And eventually in the early 1800s, when they got a, a curate to actually come and serve here, he found that the primitive Methodists had made inroads in Torxey and were meeting in some cottages of some agricultural workers, where he was rather shocked about this, uh, spoke to Lord Brownlow, Lord Brownlow bought up the cottages and evicted the primitive Methodists. So not a great day in the tolerant uh, history of the Church of England, you might say. It's always interesting to wander around these country churchyards looking for tombstones and the names tell us some interesting connection to local history. Take this one. This is Charles Thistlewood. Thistlewood is an old Lincolnshire family name. The most famous one of this family was Arthur Thistlewood from Horncastle. And Arthur Thistlewood was executed in 1820 for his part in the Cato Street Conspiracy, a plot to murder the government. Well, on Charles's tombstone, it says his end was peace. Clearly that wasn't the case with 
Arthur Thistlewood. I wonder how close their relationship was in this interesting old Lincolnshire family. Well, I've walked about 200 yards north from Torxey Church and I've come up onto the old railway line, the railway line that ran from Lincoln to Ratford and Sheffield via Sykes Junction. It is an old railway line, my cameraman was a bit nervous, but as you can see, there isn't really any likelihood of a train today. However, what we have got here is a spectacular iron viaduct, and I'm really excited about going to visit this. I've walked about a third, maybe halfway, across Torxey Viaduct. It's a very long structure to allow for the fact that the River Trent would flood uh, at vast widths, as we've seen over, over the years. Behind me, uh, there's a great view of, what, of Torxey. You can see the church uh, and also the castle. But actually the river formation here is fascinating too. And just where I am is the beginning of Torxey Island. The railway engineers actually planted some of its foundations on a small island in the middle of the River Trent. And this is a reminder that in centuries gone by, the Trent actually flowed in several different courses and there were many islands like this up and down its course. Well, I'm now going to go over to the other side of the bridge and see what I can see looking to the north, because I think there might be some things of historical interest on that side as well. At the beginning of this video, I mentioned that the Vikings were an important part of Torx's history. And then I haven't mentioned them since. You're probably thinking he's forgotten about it, but I haven't. This is the place where we can find out about Viking history. For a start, we're looking on the River Trent, the highway into England for successive Viking invaders. And we know they went up and down here many times. But we also know from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicle that the winter of 872-3, what was called the Great Heathen Army of Vikings, spent that winter time in a camp at Torx Island, Torxy as it became known. That the actual location of that camp was not known for a long time, but eventually it was discovered largely through people doing metal detecting, turning up huge amounts of material, not where people had expected in the old medieval town, but instead on a very low hill overlooking the bend of the river in the background. And if you get up close, you can just see a river cliff on the left hand side where the Trent washes round the edge of it, and then a low rise of maybe 20-25 feet. What made it a great camp for them was that it is effectively an island at the time. Between me and that high, slightly higher ground, there was an arm of the Trent which went round behind it, marshy, watery ground in wintertime particularly. So they were on a safe place, surrounded by uh, water or mud on all sides. They could pull their Viking longboats up alongside or go up and down briefly so if they wished. Thousands of them lived in that camp for the months over the winter of, of that year. So it's a really important place in English history, if somewhat bad luck if you were the local people in this vicinity, because it can't have been a very nice winter for you. Anyway, there don't appear to be any Vikings there today, so we're going to carry on across the bridge and find out why this bridge is important in English civil engineering history. I've now got to the really interesting part of this bridge. Uh, this is a bridge built on a box girder design. Now, what is important to understand is that this was quite revolutionary in 1849. John Fowler was the engineer, a rising star of the Victorian engineering profession. And he'd learned his skills uh, with the Stevensons and others, and then began to apply them working for the Manchester, Sheffield and Lincolnshire Railway, here crossing the River Trent on this spectacular design. Now what happened was that all new railways had to be approved by the Railway Inspectorate. And the Railway Inspectorate was made up of mainly retired military 
engineers. Men who'd learnt on the job but often didn't have the high level of training that men like Fowler were starting to have. So the engineer came here, looked at the design and refused to open the railway. The, ra the engineer inspector simply would not believe that Fowler's structure was strong enough to carry the weight of trains. And it provoked an enormous row in the Victorian engineering world. Could some sort of military semi-amateur stand in the way of the Institute of Professional Civil Engineers? Uh, and nonetheless, it took several months before the railway was eventually authorised and trains began running across this in 1850. So it's important for two reasons, a revolutionary design and an enormous political struggle between bureaucrats and professionals. We've come down off the railway viaduct into the Nottinghamshire side. And we've done this so we can come to this very famous viewpoint of Torxey Castle across the river. Uh, it's not really a castle. It was built about 1560 as, as a Tudor house, once a very big house uh, extending across a large courtyard back to the main road. The antiquarian Stukeley uh, he said that it had been built on the site of a Roman granary, so there's some archaeology to be done there as well. But it's most famous for its involvement in the English Civil War. And we need to see that this particular area was the front line, really, between the parliamentary garrison at Gainsborough, downriver from here, and the royalist stronghold of Newark, upriver from, from here. And the rivalry between those two was quite intense. In 1644, the Royalists launched a raid and attacked a parliamentary garrison at Torxey Lock. Uh, probably that was the reason why the parliamentary army deliberately flooded a lot of the Fenland after that in order to provide a barrier against the Royalists. But the Royalists did return uh, in 1645 and they attacked this site and destroyed much of the house. And it's never really been rebuilt ever since. But it's a house rather than a castle. Yet just a wonderfully romantic location. Lots of famous people have come here. The Gainsborough poet and writer and chartist Thomas Cooper this was one of his favourite places and he wrote lots of stories which he made up about people who'd lived in this house. So a, a really important landmark in our local scenery. Hope you've enjoyed this visit to Torxey. We've had a fantastic day here, uh, lots to see. Um, if you've enjoyed the video don't forget to, to uh, subscribe to us and, and like us and watch out for other videos about local history on the Pilgrims and Prophets channel. Thank you.